Barbarella, an anthropologist completing her PhD at the University <laughs> College London, and very importantly, Peter's granddaughter and one of the organizers of this meeting. So thanks, Raphael. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with us today. Peter Pye was my grandfather, and his presence shaped my life long before I learned about his influence on the lives of others. I was 17 when he died, and losing him came as a terrible shock. In the last few years of his life, we've become especially close friends. I developed a taste for obscure early folk music and, and from around the world, and he enjoyed sharing his encyclopedic knowledge of the musicians, of their social contexts, and the instruments and the rhythms they play. He's especially fond of teaching me about Brazilian music. As a child growing up in London with a British mother and a Brazilian father, um, he made sure that I didn't lose touch with my cultural heritage and nurtured a curiosity that shaped my path today. Um, today, I'm, I'm an anthropologist here at UCL and I work with indigenous communities who um, struggle against violations of their human rights. Um, and so I see my grandfather's great influence on me. Um, Peter Fryer, as my grandfather, more than as a political thinker, made me who I am today. He read me Dickens, he played me Brazilian nursery rhymes. He corrected my pronunciation and he taught me how to write. He inspired in me a sense of outrage, an injustice, and a commitment to make a difference. As I've grown older, I've learned more about his politics through his books and through the ways others describe his influence on them. I recently heard David Ogasoga's podcast about the effects staying power had on him, and I was profoundly moved. I began to realize that my grandfather that affected the lives of others in ways completely unimaginable to me. And that knowledge left me feeling a little bit closer to him and a little bit more involved with this work. Um, I'm sure Peter has influenced the lives of many people in this room. And this event today is an opportunity for us all to learn a bit more about the breadth and scope of his work, the links between its different strands, and the effect that it's had on others. It's also an opportunity to think about how the questions that he raised can be reformulated today and help us find ways of thinking and forms of action that can address the challenges of our times. Um, I won't say much, and so we found this here very well. Claire actually very kindly found a, a video and archive, archive footage of um, Peter uh, uh, in speaking in Brixton in 1998, um, speaking on English. Yeah. So My first word must be to play a comic from the bottom of my heart to the pioneers, to the first generation of settlers from the Caribbean, to the men and women of the Empire Windrush generation. Empire Windrush, of course, as I'm using it here, it's a figure of speech. I forget what the figure of speech is called, but the party doing service for the home. When we celebrate the arrival of that particular ship, 50 years ago last June. We are celebrating also the arrival of the Orbita, the Reina del Pacifico, the Georgic, and the other ships that brought settlers from the Caribbean to this country um, until those shameful Commonwealth immig immigrant bans of 1962 and 1968 made racism part of British law. I'm proud to honour the courage and the perseverance of those young men and women who landed at Tilbury, or who got off the boat trains at Waterloo or Paddington or Victoria in their best suits and their best dresses, who came here hoping to build a new and better life in what they have been educated, or as I would say, miseducated, to regard as their mother country. I said in their best suits and best dresses, but let us not forget, as indeed we have been reminded, that some of them were in uniform, and that some of the rest had not long been out of uniform. For during the Second World War of 1939 to 45, about 8,000 Caribbean troops have come uh, uh, um, uh, 8,000 miles, 5,000 miles across the Atlantic to serve here in Britain under the Union Jack. Courage and perseverance, these are mild enough words to, 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 to put 
the response uh, of these uh, settlers to the treatment they received here in Britain uh, during those early years. It was the best gig of my life. Then I didn't understand is what Peter was thinking when he got back to his Highgate flat on the night he suffered his uh, fatal heart attack. He'd been playing piano blues at the Carapina Bar in Archway. And he was also very much looking forward to a ceremony that was going to afford him some international recognition, international recognition that the circumstances of the 20th century had delayed for 50 years. We were bereft of his company as family members and friends when we went to the Hungarian embassy in London, where Peter's son, who's here tonight, I'm glad to say, accepted on his father's posthumous behalf the Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Hungarian Republic, awarded the citation said because of Peter's continuous support uh, for the Hungarian Revolution and Freedom Fund. And that support, of course, began in the autumn of 1956, when the uh, uh, editor of the Communist Party of Great Britain's Daily Worker, Johnny Campbell, sent Peter to Budapest with a remit to report on what the CP was describing following the official Soviet line as a counter-revolutionary uprising to restore capitalism in the so-named people's democracy. <coughs> Peter had joined the Young Communist League as a teenager in 1942 and then the party itself. He was, as he said then, a patriot of the Soviet Union, which, um, following the end of the Stalin-Hitler pact, uh, had become crucial to the, into the war against fascism in Europe. But his real loyalty was to communism itself, to what Marx had called a truly human society, not to the CP Stalinist line. On entering Hungary in 56, he quickly realized that he was witnessing not a restorationist counter-revolution, but a popular uprising of farmers, workers, intellectuals, and students against political repression. He sided with the revolutionaries. The worker in London, his dispatches were uh, edited, then spiked, and then he was expelled from the Communist Party, with his appeal rejected at the notorious party congress at Hammersmith the following spring. In the last hours before the Red Army made its second invasion on November the 3rd, 1956, brutally to suppress the revolution, Peter had offered to help edit an English language newspaper by the men that the revolutionaries were preparing. Some years later, he was deeply gratified to find that one of, the, uh, one of them had published an article in which he wrote that Peter Fryer had been the only foreign journalist who wanted to place himself directly at the service of the revolution. This small fact, the article concluded, is of capital importance as regards the, uh, as regards the character of the insurrection. The only foreign journalist who decided to act for the sake of Hungary was a communist. In 1949, Peter had covered the Hungarian government show trial of the party leader, one of the party leaders, Lazo Roy. He reported as if it had been quite genuinely at the time, as if it were proletarian justice, Reich's confession, which was made following a promise that he would be spared and reunited with his family uh, uh, to live in the Soviet Union, but which in reality resulted in his brutal execution with his wife forced to watch and his young son taken away to be brought up by a family acceptable to the regime. So when in the spring of 1956, the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, it issued his revelations about Stalinism at the 20th Party Congress. Uh, and this was followed in Hungary by Reich's cynical rehabilitation. Peter's engagement with what was a developing crisis in the Communist Party uh, was deeply personal. He felt he had to confront the part he had played in Reich's world. When I was privileged to be asked to speak at Peter's funeral, I was able to quote a tribute from one of his oldest comrades, Brian Pierce. It's, it's, it's number two on the handout, which I hope most of you have, and there are some more copies of it that uh, uh, other people join to save me a bit of time. <coughs> Brian was one of the least recognized, uh, but certainly in respect of settling accounts with Stalinism, most important members of the Communist Party's historians group, which included many figures who went on to play leading roles in British historiography. He had shared much political experience with Peter in the 1950s, and thereafter remain a lifelong friend. Marxists, wrote Brian, are often accused of being hard in the bad sense of that word, people with no conscience. 
But that was not true of Peter, whose reaction when he found he had colluded in the frame up of the Battle of the Reich shamed many of us. He was an example, a beacon to all British communists, the Lord, his moral, and his moral courage was strong enough for him to be able to withstand the abuse and slander he do with the hurled at him. Because he was insisting on facing up to the truth. Peter, said Brian, was a hard man in the good sense of the word, one who doesn't give way to the enemy's pressure. Let him and what he stood for never be forgotten. Well, we're here this evening to help ensure that Peter and what he stood for is never forgotten. And I hope that this can be beginning, as this was saying, of a process that will not only preserve, but will also reinterpret Peter's legacy and its relevance today. But the crisis of the capital system is so much further advanced, and we can now understand the Hungarian uprising as the beginning of a long and contradictory process that led to the end of Stalinism. Never has the sort of, never has the sort of theoretically informed oppositional practice for which Peter uh, strove be more sorely needed than it is today. When Peter died, we were planning his 80th birthday, an 80th birthday party for him at Caprina. Alas, it became a memorial celebration. But I refer to it because I think that tonight we can begin to accomplish something we were only able to, to imagine then. When I wrote Peter's obituary for The Guardian, the headline was The Communist Journalist Who Told the Truth About Hungary 1956. And that story and its political implications uh, an outcome were indeed what the few hundred words I was allocated focused on. I wrote that Hungarian tragedy, the book people, Peter published immediately on his return from Budapest, which he said was a work of passion, um, written in a week, or rather poured itself on the page quite hot, was comparable in its political and historical significance to John Reed's famous account of the Bolshevik Revolution, Ten Days That Shook the World, and to Robert Kappa's photo reportage from the Spanish Civil War. And its longer term significance was well defined by Stuart Hoon in his Guardian review of the 1986 edition, uh, which is number three on your handout. But Peter's reaction to the tragedy, I stress, was not passivity and despair about <coughs> communism, which others, disillusioned by Stalinism, had been all too willing to dismiss as the God that failed. Recognizing that the CP was irredeemable, Peter turned to comrades who had been active, often very courageously, uh, in the fight against both imperialism and Stalinism. He studied some of the CP's forbidden texts, particularly Trotsky's analysis of the tragic outcome of the Russian Revolution. With other comrades, like Cliff Slaughter, he joined Jerry Healy's Trotsky's club, as it was called then. Uh, Cliff, um, the Marxist social anthropologist and, and still active political critic who had known Peter since they were young communists together in Yorkshire in the mid-1940s, greatly regrets he can't be here tonight. But his contribution is the last item on the handout. And I, if you haven't got one, I hope you'll get one to, to take away and read. The Healy group was to become the Socialist Labour League and then long after Peter had left to work with the Revolutionary Party or WR. Peter edited the group's weekly newsletter and co-edited his journal, Labour Review. These publications, my guardian obituary argued, represent one of the few attempts by British Trotskyists to engage in serious dialogue, and for a while they attracted a wide range of authors. But I went on the narrow-minded and brutal authoritarianism Healy substituted for Marxist politics soon drove Fryer away. And as he put it at the time, he had been twice bitten by false leaders he had mistaken for Marxists. For a quarter of a century, he lived another life, writing on the history of Portugal, grandiosism, censorship, and above all, black history and music. His best known book, Staying Power on the Black Presence in Britain, was followed by Rhythms of Resistance, which makes a, a, a significant contribution to the study of the impact of African music in, in Latin America. The reference was all too brief, this was from the Guardian obituary, for many who had known Peter since Staying Power appeared in 1984. Peter Fraser's letter is number, is number four on the handout, as is one from Ziggy Alexander, I think, maybe here tonight, I'm not sure, um, who very justifiably complained that, that Peter Fryer's more recent and equally powerful legacy was only hinted at in the election. She had known Peter since a meeting in the mid-1980s, uh, when she had first challenged his right as a white man to write about her black history, black British history, but ended in the evening by sealing the friendship based on mutual respect. Peter's friends, she wrote, from an eclectic mix of cultures and ages, will miss his generosity 
passion, intellectual curiosity, wisdom, and I dare say it, greatness. Now these exchanges seem to me to point to the need for a coming together of some of us who had re-engaged with Peter as anti-Stalinist communists in the latter 1980s with his comrades in the black community to discuss the future of the struggle for the humane socialist future to which Peter's life was dedicated. The point was to try to create a dialogue of practical significance for young activists and scholars uh, that, uh, and that I think uh, was an aim embraced by Peter himself in the last few years of his life. When in 1985, faced with the reality of the defeat of the Great Miners' Strike, the WRP belatedly settled accounts with Terry Healy, who had about then been exposed as a corrupt sexual predator, and expelled him from the party. Peter was quick to resume relationships cut off in the late 1950s by Healy's inhumane behavior and authoritarian party building. Peter was soon contributing a regular personal column to a new weekly <coughs> workers' press, ensuring it had at least one well-written feature in each issue, yeah, probably the only one many subscribers regularly read. He covered a range of topics, including the way race is an imperialist construct, the significance of the failure of the much celebrated historian Eric Hobsbawm to confront the truth that he had supported the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, <coughs> advice to young writers on how to write theory his prose, and of course the rights of black British citizens and the importance of their history. Peter had been at Tilbury in June 1948 for the Daily Worker to interview the first arrivals in Britain from Empire Woodbridge. And it was that experience, his encounter with newcomers, who, as an idealistic young communist, he saw as living embodiments of international working class solidarity he had, that, had start, that had stirred him into action. That within that, when the British black communities erupted against state racism in 1981, uh, led him uh, to the work that was to lead to stay his, his uh, impassioned but uncompromisingly scholarly account of the black presence in Britain. At our uh, 2006 memorial meeting, we were able to bring together some comments and admirers reflecting both sides of Peter's legacy. But at the time, we weren't able to take the discussion further. Maybe we can now, as we remember Peter Fryer in the run. The man who forged a relationship with Black Britain in 1948 and took up the historical cudgels on its behalf uh, from the early 1980s was the same man who, as a courageous and principled communist, joined in struggle with the fighters against Stalinist oppression in Hungary in 1956 and returned to that struggle in the last two decades of his life. We are emerging from a period in which the very word communism, following the collapse of Stalinism and the ideologically loaded but widely accepted description of that collapse as the end of communism, became almost taboo. But as Cliff Slaughter's tribute points out, one of the central lessons of Peter's life is that it, is, it shows how to be a good communist. And that leads to me to one last point, a meeting that I know meant a lot to Peter. It happened in the mid-1990s. When he was in Budapest in 1956, the relationships he forged were with workers and frontline fighters. The key element in the revolution was the revolt of the intellectuals, organized in what they called the Peterfi Circle. One of its figureheads was the philosopher George Lukács, and one of its leading lines was his designated successor as professor of aesthetics in Budapest, Istvan Mezhoros. Mezhoros uh, came to Britain after 1956 in exile, and he became a key figure in the rethinking of Marxism for our time with books like The Power of Ideology and Beyond Capital. I wasn't present when Peter spent an emotional afternoon at his home in the, the mid-1990s. But I like to think of it as a kind of symbolic coming together of the material realities of the Hungarian revolution that Peter so honestly reported with the Marxist intellectual outcome that Eastman work, work, Eastman's work represents. But I have to end with uh, the memory Peter's oldest living comrade. It should have been close, sort of here rather than me speaking, if he wasn't able to be here. And as you'll see from the handout, he would have concluded with his last and lasting memory of Peter, appropriately a deeply human one. This is a memory of Peter Fryer, quotes, sitting at the piano, playing soulfully and beautifully Sweet Lorraine, the 1928 jazz classic made famous by Nat King Cole. Now when it's raining, I don't miss the sun. 
because it's in my baby's smile. To think that I'm the lucky one that will lead her down the aisle. Thank you. Um, I never had the pleasure of meeting Peter Fryer, which is one of my regrets. But I did meet him on the page of, I think, his most famous book, Staying Power. And although I never met him, he had a huge influence on my life. In 1986, I went into a bookshop in Newcastle, which is where I lived at the time. And I went looking for a book that I didn't know existed. It was not a book I'd read a review about, but didn't know that it was going to be there. But I needed to find a book. I'm half British and I'm half Nigerian, and I was brought up in both those traditions. <coughs> My family are white working class from the Northeast, and I was made very proud of everything they'd been to. My grandparents talked about the strikes of the 30s, difficulties of the 40s, and the Blitz. My father would tell me about his life in Nigeria. And I was half British, half Nigerian, but I was, and I'm something else, which is black British. And that identity didn't seem to mean anything at that time and that place. Black meant other, and black was the opposite of British. And this phrase that we use all the time now, black British, nobody used it when I was growing up. And in the minds of many people, it was an impossible duality. It was a contradiction. And I needed to find out how to live that identity, how to be black and British. And I wanted there to be a book to help me do that. And now that book didn't need to be there. And it certainly didn't need to be as good as it was. It didn't need to be as encyclopedic as it was. And when I found that book, when I found Staying Power in 1986, it introduced me to a history that seemed to me at the time to be warrant for my existence. It seemed to justify my right to be in Britain and show that I was part of a longer history about which I knew absolutely nothing. I know now from talking to people at Pluto Press that that book almost didn't exist. And I remember as a, as a 16 year old looking at this book and being unable to imagine how anybody could write a book that big. I now know that I was right to be in awe. I now know that the process of writing that book and getting through it, through the process with a manuscript rather than a nervous breakdown was an enormous task, almost too big a task for Peter Fryer, but he did manage it. That book is the basis of almost everything that has come after it. I don't know a book on black British history that is not quoted staying power. I was, the book was two years old when I bought it. And it was published in 1984, which was the year when my family were driven out of our home by a series of attacks. Attacks on our home, bricks thrown through the windows night after night. We looked under police protection. And we were eventually moved to, to emergency housing. And I really needed to understand not just where I was, not just the identity of the African <coughs> British. I needed to understand the forces, the ideas, and the roots of those ideas, the origins of those ideas, of the people who had chosen to do that to me and my family. And for me, and for, for thousands of people in Britain, black and white, now two generations, Peter's, Peter Fry's book, Stay in Power, was transformative. It introduced us to whole pantheon of black Britons that most of us didn't know anything about. On, st on the pages of Staying Power, I met Equiano, I met Mary Prince, Ignatius Sancho, James Garonius, so Scipio Africanus, Francis Barber, Phyllis Wheaton, Otto Bogano, James Somerset. And they've been with me ever since because I learned of their existence on the pages of Staying Power. I went looking for accounts of their lives. I read their diaries. In some cases, I've been to their graves. But I also met, on the pages of Staying Power, the architects of British racism. Often in Black History Month, we feel quite rightly the need to celebrate the resistance, the staying power of the Black British community. But we also do and we also should remember the forces that made that resistance necessary 
on the pages of Stay and Power, I also met Edward Long. I met the architect of the British race system. I discovered on the pages of Stay and Power that people who at school I was being taught to admire, Charles King, Francis Scott, Thomas Carlyle, I discovered what they thought of me. Stay and Power, in short, was everything I was not taught at school. It was a distillation of all of the missing chapters of British history brought together in one extraordinary encyclopedic book. And every book written since quotes staying power. Or if it doesn't quote staying power, it quotes the sources that we didn't know existed that Fryer exhumed from the archives to create staying power. It's a uniquely important book. My own books, all of them, have been built on the lessons that I learned, not just the knowledge, but the idea that you could take control of history, that you could go in pursuit of it, that you could write books, that you could find the missing chapters, that they had not been destroyed, they'd just been mislaid, sometimes intentionally. Staying power was part of an act of the stock in the salvage. There had been a few books about black British history before that, or there had been chapters, or that had been mentioned the black presence in Britain before that, but nothing Nothing on that scale. It's a remarkable book. And it's, it means a lot to me to, when I encounter young black, black British people who've read something I've written, that my words out there have impacted upon their lives. And it means a lot to me because I know exactly what it was like to sit there as a 16 year old and have my mind expand, have my horizons change, have my understandings of my place in my country transformed through the pages of the book. I have no idea how many times I've read Stay and Power. I have no idea how many copies I've had. I've lost so many. I've given some away. I've, some of them have been so full of marginal notes that they've been unreadable. It's the greatest compliment you could give to a writer. It's the greatest achievement you could ask for as a writer to know that your work utterly transformed someone's life. I am standing here today, I do what I do today, because of Peter Fryer, and because he took the time to engage in that enormous task of writing that enormous book. I'm incredibly grateful to him. I'm grateful to be here tonight. Thank you. Um, well, I'm really delighted and uh, honored to even have been asked uh, to come today. And much of what I've got to say is going to mirror much of what um, uh, David and in some ways Terry has said, not least because uh, it turns out Peter, Terry, and I have a peculiar, um, one peculiar thing in common, which is that we were all in the WRP. <laughs> I was in the WRP when I was 15. Um, I, Left when I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was asked to leave. <laughs> um, and I'm really delighted that we're here in Black History Month with this book and this person because all too often Black History Month is told in the passive voice. Rosa Parks was kicked off the bus. People were enslaved, um, toilets were segregated, and so you have the objects of racism, but none of the subjects. Things are done to people, but nobody does them somehow, which mirrors a kind of moment that we are having now. We apparently have racism with no racists. And, um, and so this notion of our history, which is quite enduring, that on the one hand, people will say, we won the war, even if they didn't fight. Or they'll say, we won the World Cup, even if they didn't play, even if they weren't alive. But somehow, nobody enslaved anybody. <laughs> nobody raped anybody, nobody stole anything. And so, power <coughs> becomes this wonderful omniscient parent and the brutality it takes to acquire it is always an awful. And so to 
have a document like this about black history written by someone like Peter tells us that black history isn't a subgenre of history. It's not like there's history here, and then there's the thing that black people do. That it's our history, that there is no black history without white history, there is no black people without white people, that this is history. And so the fact that, uh, and I would have been, you know, I would have been more than delighted if it had been a black person who had written it, and the fact that it was a white person has its benefits, actually, in understanding that this is our history and uh, we should um, claim it together. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a bit from the uh, foreword that I wrote for the book. It starts with a quote from Tony Morrison, who says, a very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Someone says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists work on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Someone says you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Now, for the longest time, the central distraction for black Britons was insisting on our existence that we were black was unarguable, that we were in Britain was acknowledged if only to be contested. But the notion that we could be black and British, both from this place and in our bodies, confounded many, if not most. Britain, we were told, was an essentially white place to which we had only just arrived. We had no history here. The colonial connections that explained our existence were at best opaque and at worst unknown to most, even as they were mythologized in the very statues and monuments that surrounded us. Our past did not come up in curricula or mediated conversation. To be uninformed, ill-informed, and misinformed, which included those who charged themselves with curating the natural narrative, we came from nowhere and for no good reason. This had an impact on both our politics and our self-perception. The belief that we have come from somewhere, wrote historian E. H. Carr, is closely linked to the belief that we are going somewhere. Our view of history reflects our view of society. And in this, I just mirror David's experience of finding this book and thinking, there I am. I was looking for me. I was looking for some historical connection. I knew that I had a history. Um, but it was well hidden, even as kind of there were, uh, how would you say, kind of um, acknowledgements of it almost in plain sight, it was still well hidden. And this really kind of breathtaking, panoramic, um, exhaustive history was what I needed to I mean, not get started. I'd started. I'd started already. I'd started when I'd already been kicked out of the working revolution <laughs> party. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it gave me the equipment. It gave me the equipment to kind of engage who I was with where I was and what I might be. It told me that I had a past. And that did contribute to the notion that I might have a future. Effectively orphaned by the most accessible and partial national story available, many black women sought surrogate historical parents elsewhere and found them in America. The story of racial disenfranchisement and resistance we adopted as our own. That was the story of Black History Month, and all too often still is. Pictures of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you know, great, great people. Uh, people who should be studied and understood, but that was pretty much the only black history I did at school, uh, was the I Have a Dream speech. Um, so a book like Fries that starts with a sentence, there were Africans in Britain before the English came here. 
serves as the basis to a transformative understanding not only of the past but the present and the future. When my uh, piece went in The Guardian and it had that as the headline of one of my uh, school friends on Facebook said, that's a pretty tall claim. <laughs> and I just said, well then deny it. This man's done his work. What do you have? I'm not sure what Facebook turns out. <laughs> <laughs> its scholarship did not simply establish our presence here over the centuries in vivid detail as a fact. The way in which he told it rooted our presence in a tradition of struggle with a particular and organic relationship to Britain. That this edition, which came out last year, should emerge in the year that marks the 70th anniversary of Windrush, the 50th anniversary of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, and the 25th anniversary of the murder of Stephen Lawrence matters. For Stan Power provides us with the necessary tool to unravel the morass of self-congratulation, myth, melancholic nostalgia, and hollow, narrowly tailored remorse that tends to underpin scheduled moments of racial commemoration. It matters too that it was published in 1984, that it was published in a year of intense class struggle, the minor struggle, in between three, uh, three years after the uprisings in Brixton and Topters and St. Paul, a couple of years before more uprisings in, uh, 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 in London uh, and elsewhere. It was a book of its time. And that has kept with the times, as is, 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 remains well. With Fire as our guide, we know that whatever multicultural bonhomie we enjoy now is a product not of Britain's innate genius and sense of fair play, but of bitterly fought struggles in which the political and media class have often resisted progress. We know that in those struggles, black people have had allies as well as enemies among white Britons and trade unions and that these struggles were not fought in a vacuum, but were always part of the broader economic, political, and social landscape. Fryer shows us that black British history is not a subgenre of British history, but an integral part of it. So tightly woven into the fabric that any attempt to unpick, uh, unpick it would make the whole thing unravel. With sufficient imagination and solidarity, all sorts of black Britons, all sorts of Britons can see themselves in this book, and spark their own transformative reckoning with who we are and how we got here. Indeed, had more liberals read it, they would have understood events since the financial crisis as consistent with Britain's racial history, <coughs> rather than aberrant to it. The rise of the xenophobic hard right in a period of economic crisis, ensuring a steady flow of arsenic in the water supply of our political culture, is not new, even if the imperial fancy in our foreign policy the domestic agenda guided by austerity, war, closed borders, and a permanent state of terror has created the current framework in which it might fester. The nature of exclusion and discrimination may evolve from race to religion, and color to culture, and even language, even as the nature of resistance and rebellion would evolve with it. We cannot know the destination of those struggles, but thanks to Friar, we are far more aware of their source. We've got sheets going around, um, Simon's got there, for names and emails if you would like to continue to be informed of future events around Peter's legacy and around some of these themes. So if you want to, please do fill them in. Okay, so um, we'll call as many people as possible, obviously, um, and if people could try to remember there may be lots of contributions, so we may have to call people just once. Okay, so. That would be um, something to bear in mind. And I suppose there might be some direct questions, um, and that's fine too. And if you want to come in at any point, please do. Anybody's make a contribution. Just two marks. We'll pass it back. Okay, right. Okay, right. Can I see who would like to make a contribution? 
Okay, thank you very much for this. It was quite useful. I want to speak to Spain Power. When I, I saw it online, that uh, it was going to be republished. I tweeted and I hope that there's an addendum to it because history does change. The book was written 30 years ago since then. Some new histories have come to light. And it pains me that this is a book that is on, will be on all the reading lists of the burgeoning acting history programs in um, colleges such as this, certainly in um, Goldsmith and Brit Birmingham City University, they call our current programs. Students are about, quote, setting out from, um, what is it, prior, that time has since moved, it's not quite correct. For example, we say John Archer, the first African to be elected to civil office. We know that in 1906, there was another person called William Henry Sylvester Williams, and also Dr. Aaron Means was the, uh, the mayor in Norfolk in 1904, well before John Archer, stuff like that. We still continue to talk about 492 Jamaican citizens in the moon rush. That is rubbish. So these things, I think, need to be pointed out. Also, there's an argument about the Queen Elizabeth proclamations. So uh, I'm really speaking not to our, our contributors, but to um, to Pluto books. We need an agenda because this is a key reading um, list book, and students should not be educated and that history is far from the nowhere we're at in 20. I think that that's entirely true, but of course one of the reasons why we need an addendum is because so many people have discovered so much more because they were inspired by Friar. So we know so much more because we knew where to look. The example of the Caspar Van Senden letter, the letter that implies that Queen Elizabeth I wanted to expel the, the, the black and words from, from, from Britain. Well, Fryer was quoting Jim Walden because that's what people thought at the time. But the people who've shown that this was more complicated, shown that that was a unique event rather than a sort of nationwide proclamation, well, they're, they're, they're people like Onyeka Nubia and, and Miranda Kaufman, all of whom are inspired by Fryer. So it's almost Fryer has sort of created the reason for the need for an addendum because he inspired so many people. But also a lot of what's happened is that we, we found new evidence that shows that Fryer was right. So, the revolution that's taken place in isotope testing. A friar had a tiny fragments of evidence of the presence of Afro Romans. There was this, I mean, literally there, there, there is an inscription, there's two, two artifacts that give us the existence of the, the Moorish regiments in the Northeast near Carlisle on the Roman Wall. Since then, the revolution in isotope testing means that all of these historic uh, Roman remains that were exhumed over the past few hundred years. We can now go back to those remains and with a combination of isotope testing and with measurements of, uh, of cranium and, uh, and the physical differences between ethnic groups, we can determine that there were Africans. We don't need to rely on the evidence that Friar had. We now have scientific evidence. So what, what I love about that, the, the, the passage that, that Gary um, Gary mentioned is he was more right than he knew because he didn't know about the ivory bamboo lady. He didn't know about the itchy head lady because the scientific methods, the the, uh, the forensic sciences that have proved their ethnicity didn't exist then. So the, the, if we do have an addendum, I'd like one that also said how often he was right more than he could have known. Thank you very much. Um, And if you look at his books and if you look at his letter, 
an open letter to the members of the Socialist Labour League and other Marxists in 1959. It is absolutely, I think, it's absolutely clear that the connections between the various things that he wrote have to do with his Trotskyism. And I don't think that should be missed out. Now, some people, I know one of the speakers referred to Trotskyism, but to call him as a communist, is open to be a place of misinterpretation. He was a revolutionary communist, a Trotskyist. And I think that that's a key part of explaining the variety of his writings. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, but I think, sorry, Raphael, I'm back there on the top. If anybody wants to respond, to it, we can just chat. Can I, can I pay my voice? Yes, yes. Um, it's, you know, I don't think it's true that the book is in all university libraries and also not on reading lists. Uh, that, you know, we've had 30 years, and it, it's not there. I know that at the institution I work in, I have to go and put it on the reading list. I have to go and do that. So I think if there is a job to be done by ourselves, the work of Decolonize keeps, keeps coming up, it is to say, this book needs to be there. This book needs to be framed. But as part of that, the reason I believe also that it has gone missing, if you like to call it, is that people have adopted a different method of investigation, right? And I thought Fry's investigation of history was paramount, and which I see in both the writings of uh, Gary and David quite a lot. So the question for me is, what is the method, the process, the methodology that Fryer has adopted that has played that crucial role in bringing the history out? Because what has tended to happen <laughs> is that we are told the grand narrative is finished, and as part of that, we are looking just at things like identity, but not at history itself, at contending powers, uh, struggles that have taken place which have actually shaped it. So that's my question. Thanks very much. Thank you for the presentation. I, I too um, want to pay tribute to the research and writing of the Black Question in Britain that was done by Peter Pryor, which has informed the work of my organization as far as this league, uh, the International Congress League, when we write about the fight against racism in Britain. Um, but I want to talk about the uh, contributions that Peter Fryer made in 1956 um, when he covered the Hungarian Workers' Revolution, the, the political revolution, which uh, was an uprising against Stalinism. Those workers built workers' councils and were fighting to defend the collectivized property. They were fighting for socialism. It was a far cry, in fact, what they were fighting for from today's protests in Hong Kong, uh, which are decked out with Union Jacks and American flags, which is aimed at counter-revolution in China. And we, Trotskyists, defend the Chinese deformed worker state, uh, and therefore political revolution might be hungry, but a successful political revolution in China to open the road to socialism. Now, um, what happened in Hungary in 1956 confirmed Trotsky's analysis and program of political revolution. Peter Fryer uh, brought that to light in his, in his work and told the truth. Um, and as has been alluded to here, the organization that he joined, and he incidentally led, I think, hundreds more from the Communist Party into uh, the uh, Jerry Hinley's organization, uh, people who wanted to become Trotskyists. But that organization was uh, Trotskyist or Leninist only on paper. And uh, our founding cadre, the Spartacist tendency founding cadre, were also impressed at a great distance uh, from uh, Rick, uh, Jerry Hinton's organization. And the literary output of it, including Peter Fryer's Leninist philosopher, which we um, imprinted in of our of which we still use today in educating our members about 
this connection between Africa and imperialism and, and Britain. But without imperialism and slavery, I don't think, and this is a question, uh, that the Industrial Revolution would have happened because the growth of capital through the massive profits from uh, the empire and slavery in general uh, produced uh, the British, British history. So it's not just black history or white history, it's all black history. Um, and uh, secondly, I think Peter's uh, purpose in writing was a black history. He was a revolutionary communist, and his writing was to help us all understand and build a party or a movement to destroy capitalism. Um, so for me, the elephant in the room is the absence of a real genuine communist party throughout the world. Um, and then, um, so I want to say uh, just something. Uh, so after uh, 1985 and the end of the WRP, um, Else. And then Corbyn came along with an anti-imperialist position and shook up the Labour Party. Now, I think people, most people here don't have illusions that the Labour Party can be a revolutionary party. However, I think it's really important to support Corbyn's anti-imperialist project. Um, and and, and that, uh, that's where the struggle is at the moment. And we see racism in the form of the use of anti-Semitism being used against him. We see everything being thrown against him. It's just a little inch of reformism. All he's talking about is being nationalizing some of the basic industries, and yet he's absolutely good at it. Anyway, so that's the practical, I'll stop there, practical question. Thank you. So we take the up there no, speak. Okay, so, yes, carry on, so speak. Um, still quite in the end um, of the course of the future, my question was... What what is is the up, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm still kind of, um, in the course of the future of the seventeen. And my question was, what is the biggest problem with how the education system actually teaches that history of the country? Somebody will say if you want to answer it. There was somebody up there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all those speakers. And, um, yeah, thanks for that question. I went for um, coffee, a cup of coffee, and that was received sort of the same speech. It said, celebrating black history. It didn't take me up. It said, same thing for time. One of the group, and one of the companies, like, you know, celebrating for and stuff like that. And one hand, you think, hmm, is this really what Peter Fire wrote the book for? Really? Uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I mean, if people want to, you know, what we thought I did was bring together, he was like, who wanted to black British history? I think brought together a lot of work that was really being done by other people, including this, um, making by uh, J.A. Rogers, Dominican, Peggy Scobie, Nigerian, Colin Shylon, one round of Today and stuff. But what, what we tried to do was bring a lot of that together, together a whole range of other history together. But he also, it's his, what he, what he largely had as a Marxist was his historical method, you know, I think. And, the way he stood on the back of people like C.L.R. James, Mary Williams, people like that whole tradition coming apart from the tradition, but other broadly more Marxist tradition. Uh, and it had this brilliant intersection there for kind of race and class, uh, kind of throughout, particularly once you get the emergence of the working class movement recovering history of black British radicals. Um, you know, you mentioned that Brianna, but also you know, people like um, William Davidson, Robert okay. Wedderburn, uh, William Cuffey. Um, up to the sack of the far you know, you can bring Claudia, you know, Claudia Jones, you know, a whole tradition of people who are rooting in the world, and actually seeing that, really, as, as the one of the two struggles, you know, interact how things like Haitian revolution in terms of English working class, how when there's a big class struggle in Britain, the miners strike, for example, back in colleges, you know, even black, black workers in Britain and in London and stuff, you get this interplay of solidarity, and I think that is the method, that's the tradition, I think that's what's missing from black British as a whole in schools, essentially. They don't mention capitalism, and they don't mention the capitalist resistance to what capitalism did to Africa from the, uh, you know, from slave, from slavery, uh, from the middle class, from the plantations, and the resistance that continuous round um, and revolutionary uh, struggles with uh, I want, I want just two, two things. One thing, you know, people should read, obviously, get um, 
Peter Fry's book into the library, but also you know, get David or, or so you know fully book because although David you don't mention British radicalism so much, you do bring you know amazing amount of work and just other work which is fantastic. And I've one final plug for a book that's come out with Z Press called uh, Black British History by edited by Happy Maddie. And that's got a nice good selection of young scholars and scholars uh, doing fantastic work on black British history and it's in very much a different position for So I'm not going to answer everything that's been said, but I do think it's interesting, I mean, I don't know work in the academy, but I think there is always a risk of us assuming that because we're all in this room together that the world is this room, and that, I mean, what I'm hearing is actually we maybe haven't come as far as we should have done or could have done or might do, we've got more uh, uh, work to do in terms of making what was a reality for me or David a reality for um, uh, for other people. I actually think one of the central problems with the way that Black History Month is taught in, I've got two kids at school in Hackney, and first of all they teach it in terms of kings and queens and achievement and kind of um, all the, the stuff that you were talking about of just kind of just a celebration of black excellence, as opposed to recording black life. Um, and so sometimes it's kind of quite hard for people to see themselves in this kind of um, story where it's like, well, if you're not Martin Luther King, then you're probably not going to kind of get it done. You know? And I um, <coughs> was asked in my son's school, well, what, you know, what, what would you think we should do? And I said, well, Rina Hackney, which produced Britain's first black female, MP, there will be people who went to the school who would have campaigned in that, or you know, or people's grandparents or parents. You could get the local MP along. These kids are kind of seven, eight, nine, ten. This is history to them, and it's a history that they can um, relate to. There will be it's a bit more complicated, but still uh, necessary. There will be people who were around during the riots in eighty one, and eighty five, and eighty seven get them in and have them talk. And so that people feel that that history is actually a part of their life and not just something that happens to clever people and famous people and posh people and, uh, and all the rest of it. And the last thing I'd say, and I'd be interested to know what David's um, experience was. Uh, and I just put this out there. I didn't know when I read the book that Peter was a Marxist. I didn't know that. And, um, um, but I felt a kind of um, uh, organic relationship between a man and his work. And I felt that when I say I can see myself in it, that's because I came from a working class family and I could see myself in it. I felt that he was, but he never, I never, I never thought I'm really, I didn't know whether he was black or white. First of all, just didn't know that until. I mean, 10 years after I finished the book. And um, it read like good history, uh, which, you know, I think the fact that it's Marxist has something to do with that, but I didn't know. Um, <coughs> I didn't know. <laughs> what, what to me? I remember thinking, after I read Stan Power, that it was too good to be true, that this got to be wrong. Yeah. That, that yeah. There can't be this yeah. much, we can't have a book this big with our history. I've been so conditioned to the idea that we have no tenure in Britain that I, I, I do remember doubting it. Uh, and that's why, the, I mean, you, you're right to mention the, the number of writers that, that Peter Fryer referenced. There's also a lot of primary research. There's also a lot of government documents. There's also work in the VRO. And we mustn't think that it's all about synthesis of other scholars. There's direct work in there. Um, and that, that's where the footnotes and the appendix became so important to me, because it was impossible to doubt it. Because if you, you read something, you could back it up. But the, the extent to which I knew nothing until I had that, that book, there'd been riots five years earlier, five years after, uh, before I bought the book which I'd be a kid and I'd watch. 
But then I discovered there'd be riots in 1950 and 1948 and 1919. And most importantly, I discovered that the word riot in every case was misused. It wasn't riots. These were attacks upon the black community for various reasons, very often to do with uh, financial stress, very often to do with the search and the need to find an external enemy. But the patterns, the rhythms of what I'd experienced in my kind of brief consciousness, the fact that that was part of a longer history, a longer trajectory, that's what um, I learned in the book. But I think, you know, to go talk about method methodology, that appendix was just incredibly important. I didn't know how books were constructed, I didn't know how knowledge was constructed. I spent as much time looking at the appendix, moving back and forth within that book as I did reading it as a narrative. I didn't, I noticed how brilliantly read, how brilliantly written it was, because it was brilliantly written. Just a quick word. Um, I mean, I think Peter had one great advantage as a historian. He didn't work at a university. <laughs> <laughs> And his, his, his great part of his book of Marxists, in, he started from experience and the practice of the work he done. His father had been uh, sympathetic to fascism, to most things. So he, he was brought up in the kind of atmosphere of class struggle. He initially, after the war, he joined the, the Yorkshire Post, and he had to leave because they said he couldn't be in the Communist Party uh, and, and work for the Yorkshire Post. And then, of course, there was the whole experience of, of, of Hungary. Um, and um, actually, before that, meeting the Windrush arrivals, new people, and then being regenerated by the uh, state racism and the rights against it uh, in, uh, in, in 1981. So all the time he was coming from that, from that practice. I think that was his method. I think that was it. And Gary is sort of reflecting that when he says, well, get the people who experienced it into the schools when they're still around and they're still alive and so on. And he was not coming from somebody who had a career to follow uh, and a book to write to, 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 to be part of it. Um, he was not coming from somebody with a theory to prove it. But yes, he was a very committed Marxist. Um, and indeed, uh, of course, Trotsky is, and that was important. It was important as long as Stalinism dominated the world. Uh, Part of the world <coughs> dominated the world labor movement. Uh, it, it ceased to be uh, important in the same way after 1989. And that was now quite a long time ago. Um, I mean, the only other thing I would say in terms of Peter's method of research is that, uh, yes, as some colleagues have said, read, read about Hungary too. Read Hungarian tragedy. Now, this is the most recent edition, I think it's 1996. And I just picked it up as a way of reading Hungarian tragedy again. But look at it. He put enormous work into this. He went back to all the other things he'd written at the time. Again, the footnotes in this edition are extraordinary. And why did he do that? Because, yes, he, he, he wanted, as well as his virgin reputation as the black historian, he, he wanted his experience to be part of the knowledge of a new generation. And I mean, that to me is what we're here to do tonight. I'm looking around the room. Almost everybody here is considerably younger than I am. And I read a few of you are younger than David and Gary. <laughs> um, and even some of you who, you know, in another meeting, and I hope there will be more, uh, will hopefully be much more the target audience. Because we're here to bring uh, what Peter represented in, in the totality of this to a new generation, not to pay tribute to Peter just as such, um, or even with respect to, to colleagues who I'm deeply grateful for being here and helping get this whole discussion going, um, not, not simply because of the impact he's had on the important people, but because the impact what he represents needs to have today on a generation that is out there protesting, but protesting with an awful lot of lack of knowledge of things that Peter can teach them or his life and, and, and those talking about it can teach them. That to me what this what I hope is the beginning of a process, not just a meeting, um, it, it is all about. It's how we engage now uh, with, uh, uh, with the young people who are out there protesting 
on climate, um, on uh, on indeed on capitalism and the need to get rid of it. Somebody up the back? Yeah. So I'll stand up and speak very loud. Very good. Well done. Good. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much to the uh, uh, contributors. I really enjoyed the conversations um, as you've been sparked uh, with this evening's event. Thank you for putting it on. I'm mindful um, uh, in watching the video, in thinking in how Peter Fryer starts out his talk about the Windrush in 1989, sorry, 1998, which was the 50th anniversary of the Windrush, this video where he's speaking in front of the stage in Lambeth Town Hall, that he starts speaking about the Windrush by acknowledging that it was not the first or the only ship. He speaks about the Rio del Pacifico, the Orbiter, the Georgic. Um, and to echo what uh, um, Christian was saying, it's, we should be mindful that staying power is not the first and the only. And then there will be other scholarship. I think Christian spoke about um, uh, Shylon and Scobie and their 72 and 77 books. Um, I'm also mindful of the, the people that Peter Fry was sharing the stage with that evening. People like uh, Sam King, uh, who was a passenger on the Windrush, Oswald Dennison, Columbus, as we call him in Brixton, who was also a passenger on the Windrush, Nadia Cathouse, the uh, uh, Honduran actress, uh, the uh, adorable, of the Wilmot, who was also, well, his brother was a passenger on the Windrush. Um, Peter was, uh, as I see it anyway, uh, Peter was sharing that stage with these people who had experienced uh, this, and, and it's those people whose names I've just called who really, along with the impact of staying power, the reason why we remember Windrush as a, as a point of historical importance, but it's very often it's those people whose names aren't called. Uh, Arthur, sorry, um, Sam King was the author of a short essay called 400, 500 Jamaicans. Um, and Sam King is, is responsible and he writes about the Windrush and is responsible for it as well. Um, I'm also mindful of Caribbean uh, communists and activists, people like uh, Richard Hart, uh, Billy Strachan, uh, Trevor Carter, um, Winston Pinder whose names we, we do not call in the same way that we speak about Peter Fryer and his impact. So we, for me, one thing that I am often uh, try to do, the work that I do, is to be mindful of who gets left out of the narrative, to be mindful of um, what happens when we elevate or when people think about staying power as being the only book that could be on a reading list, who gets left off. <laughs> Somebody wants to know who you are. Uh, my name's Kelly. <laughs> Sorry? Where would we find you? <laughs> okay, so, so my name's Kelly Foster. I work as a public historian, mostly as a freelance. Uh, I work as a guide in walking tours in London, mostly black, black, black history, about working class history, about women's history. One of the things that's so integral to the work that I do is using oral history simply because when thinking about these micro histories of community, that history has a value to it. It's still there in the archive, still there in resources, which is why important. Uh, it's important this, this event that Peter Fryer did in the, uh, 98 was also done in partnership with Black Cultural Archives. And so that's why it's important that these collections are also supported because even though Stay in Power, as it's been illustrated in the methodology of Stay in Power and Stay in Power's use of the archive, there's an awful lot of work that hasn't been done, that hasn't been written. And uh, those archives deserve our support as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to start with thanking Ted Foster. It was amazing. And for me, of learning that I didn't know, um, I was very fortunate to know people for a while in my youth. Growing up in London in the late 70s, in an era of where racism was fought on the streets, it's like Lady Well. Uh, I remember the sense that there was a crisis for those who wanted to welcome and embrace the black community. Part of my experience of growing up in London uh, responded to. And I feel that the event today is important in terms of raising questions like the young man who said, 
What should we be doing in schools to help people know more about black history? Because Peter's book is an amazing uh, uh, piece of work, and one on which a whole body of scholarship has developed. And yet, I work in a university, I'm painfully aware of the debates about decolonizing the curriculum are very underdeveloped, are very easily hijacked by voices of voices on the right rear who would make the case that freedom of speech uh, should mean that we, we shouldn't be afraid to uh, keep our statues of Cecil Rhodes up. And then there's a very little acknowledgement, despite fantastic television programs like some of the ones that David has done about the relationship between the wealth in London and colonialism. I still feel that the British history narrative doesn't own colonialism nearly enough. And the manifestation of colonialism amongst us is that we live in what could be, and should be, and can be, a sort of vibrant multiculturalism where we're really lucky that we're all together here from all parts of the world rather than there being some sort of untold story about why the world is structured as it is in terms of race now. You need to do a lot of that. Just to just, just respond to that, if I may, the, the emotional feeling that I got from today, um, was meeting the people like this at the time, the people who are the people who are part of the country and about YouTube. But the, it is those connections, those colonial connections, with the other things that I really thought about. I had worked out before I read that book the centrality of sugar to the 18th century, the British economy. There was, a, there was an epiphany moment for me about the book, growing up in the north, where the industrial revolution was the center of all of the history that I was taught. And it was really big to say about that I worked out that the disindustrial revolution. It was about creating factories and mills that processed cotton. And I worked out reading, and I remember them very powerfully. And I worked out reading to Nepal where the cotton came from. And I had not seen the connection between cotton slavery in the American East South and the Industrial Revolution. History I was being taught at school and in the North, that's everything you taught at school. No one ever made that connection. And I, you know, to answer the question about what she did to me, how that she did to me, as much as we should teach the family and the black and the Jews, the Brian L. Dixon, we should break those missions, those disconnects, and those moments in which there's a centrality, the mainstreaming of black and the Jews, it is deliberately denied. And that question of when does an mission become alive? The fact that I never was told at school where the company came from in the form of half a thousand miles in Lancashire, that's not an accident. And that's what we need to change. And to this latest question about uh, um, the, 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 the area of Williams question, which I right. does touch on, is to get out of other books. But what we're in UCL, we're in the place where the latest of the British Labour Leadership Project is actually trying to number a crunch <laughs> to try to prove, to try to answer the questions that the area of Williams posed all those years ago. We went and Nicky Draper and Captain Wall have done their work to try to discover so not just what happened to the to the 20 million, or well, some characters, 28 million to their given compensation at the end of slavery, but the billions before that, in the two centuries of British slavery and slave trading, that they led up to that moment and made abolition necessary. But we're in the, in the university where the, the, the intellectual engine to answer that question is, is worrying for two more years to go, and hopefully many more years after that. Uh, so, uh, I was also in the Workers Revolution Party, another one, um, and uh, thinking back to the uh, 70s and 80s, I mean, we had these very, very powerful ideas, uh, and I think we were trying to share them with our fellow human beings, very often in an incredibly doctrinaire way, which people have spoken about, and I mean, what was a to me, working with Peter in the late 1980s, when he, he sort of came back into being able to uh, work with others, or less because we'd broken up the old WRP, and what was really, I mean, he knew how to have a conversation with his fellow people, right? 
And uh, what made me think of that, and why I wanted to say it to you, was when you guys said that you, know, you read this whole book, and actually he hadn't had to write in big capital letters, you know, that he was a Marxist, uh, but that was clear in the way that he'd written it, and the method, and, the, and you know, this incredible kind of seriousness and uh, obsession with facts. I mean, to work with him as a journalist, I mean, was, a, was an education. You know, he took facts extremely seriously, and, and as in the book, you know, what actually happened. But he did that. He did that because he was approaching it as a Marxist, and uh, so I think he succeeded in doing what a lot of us found very difficult, which was to have that, to have those conversations with all sorts of other people. And I mean, I, I hope that I mean, if we if we start by talking to each other as we're doing this evening, perhaps that's one of the ways of honouring his legacy. Hands up, it's outside the Milton Keynes. Hands up, Park. 
But the uh, you. Yeah, you can the HP is a really good place to to be angry about this one. Okay, up in the balcony. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I'm here to have a look at the Well, my question is obviously it's very important to work back British history, but a lot of uh, people in the UK, the diaspora, people in the Caribbean, and Africa. Uh, I was just wondering, how do we tackle uh, decoloniality narrative in those countries? I just came up with Jamaica, because I have incredibly colonial uh, countries and uh, a very Victorian authoritarian, quasi fascist uh, education system that they have over there. I'm sure it's the same in a lot of former colonies. I just wonder how do you take the knowledge that is being produced here and translate it into um, places where these vile or repressive regimes Okay. Um, right. <laughs> sorry, no, not sorry. Bonnie's behind you. Young man behind you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I start by saying I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry uh, for what I'm about to do because I feel like when you come to these discussions, you always have like an entryist person and make it all about their political objective. Um, I was actually here two years ago when you were speaking, Gary, and someone doing the exact same thing, exactly what I was saying. Uh, but literally, 20 seconds. Um, everybody knows we have a general election coming up and we have a conservative party, a reactionary uh, conservative party. And sorry for the clothes I'm wearing, I'm wearing blue, but I'm wearing blue <laughs> on the red side, but on the radical side. So now we're talking about Labour, and I'd like to talk to you, sister, about being the revolutionary credentials. And we're going to talk about the point is to do this and to win this election. Everybody has to be involved. 2017 was good, but we need five times to have people involved to win that election. And to do that, Labour momentum already getting organised, getting this. And nobody wants to be an armchair socialist, but you can literally be an armchair socialist and make calls. The nitty gritty of winning this election will involve talking to people in marginal seats who like to get involved if you want to win this election. So if you're serious about doing it, come talk to me afterwards. We're taking names. We need people to do this. Okay. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Proper black historian, he said, on 
parallel crime problem of their history. But I think, you know, so he, but he was aware that he was only doing a partial um, contribution. I think that he, he laid the groundwork for, for people like me and others to really think about their history in a different way. Do you know, there's been talk here about what's taught in schools, not even Dershon. You know, the New Cross Fire, and, for instance, the Battle of Dershon in 1977, when the National Cup were off the street, is barely known. <coughs> The, um, the, wind, the, 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 the New Cross fire, when 13 black children were killed, <coughs> the whole state took absolutely no notice. It led to a march of 10,000 people from the New Cross all the way to Hyde Park in Aston Marathon. Um, those are things that are, do you know, the people who go to school in Lewisham, we haven't heard about that. I met people with a goldsmith who did some great work on this. I met people <coughs> that I can live with black friends in across all my life and didn't know about this. There's, there's, there's a real lack of um, uh, real life history as it's being referred to people who can talk about the struggle they went into. And yes, that should come into the school. Um, Peter also did meetings, about meetings, about the aspect of black history. He did a little book that's about the writing called Loose and the Figures and the Brief. I don't know if it's on the books or there. But he made an amazing contribution to in many senses. And I certainly remember him as a revolutionary communist. He taught me a lot and he taught me a lot about developing this book. I won't talk about that right. so There's two people here. Yeah. Can you speak without the mic? I think so. I'll try. Uh, I was the uh, international communist for the international well, that's what how we have here. The first thing I want to say is campaigning for the Labour Party, as uh, the camera behind me was talking about, is not going to get you anywhere in the struggle against racial or any other kind of oppression. The answer to oppression is the fight for a socialist revolution in this country and around the world, led by a Leninist, Trotskyist, Vanguard Party which Peter Breyer, in his prime, would have argued for. And this is what we call for today. And it is because of our interest and struggle to build a Leninist vanguard party that I have to take up a couple of things that were said here today. By the way, I should point out that if you want to read more about this, we put out a pamphlet every Black History, U.S. Black History Month, called Black History and the Class Struggle which underlines the point I just made about the socialist revolution. <clears throat> Jeremy Corbyn is not an anti-imperialist. Jeremy Corbyn is a supporter of the imperialist European Union, and that is why we cannot count them as a vote for labor in this election. <laughs> Sorry, I know that I know that the I know that, I know that I know I know. I'm just saying I know that the young man behind you opened to this discussion, but I think actually well, there, there's other ways to have it. To okay. Peter Pryor. Yeah, I know. This is what we're talking about, yes. the politics yeah. that motivated Peter Pryor. Absolutely. When he was around what would border Yes. Um, yes this speaker is making us remember just how ridiculous we were at You were ridiculous. <laughs> The production of WRP was political. The WRP set up Arthur Scargill on the eve of the migrant sorry, sorry. to isolate that struggle sorry. from the rest of the labor movement. I think, I think you need to sit down. Okay. You don't want to have that here. So don't make politics for that. I think it's time. Yeah. The communists that no, we fight me. for, the communism of Marx, no, Edward Lenin, and Trump. Excuse me. Stop. Would you no, sit no. down now? And finally, just on. Yeah, do draw to a close because you're actually driving some people away from a good discussion. Well, I apologize, okay. but this so, is what the politics so is about. You know, okay, sit down. Thank you very much. Yeah.
present. And in some ways, the way in which slavery, for example, is talked about, it's as if it's over, it's in the past. We can look at it as a white guilt, or we can look at it in terms of reparations. But for me, uh, and, and I have a personal interest here, and I was declared that when I uh, wrote a book on modern slavery, um, it was not made uh, part of the discussions in the Black History Month because it, there were a lot of black people who felt that it diminished the idea of transatlantic slavery by talking about modern slavery. But for me, the, the continuities were exactly the ones that we were talking about around capitalism and exploitation of people and a lot of the migrants in Britain today who are here of uh, in the uncertain status. They are living in conditions of appalling slavery. And for me, the understanding of our slave, slave, historical <laughs> slavery is to influence uh, <coughs> the way in which we take action today. And I think that that's not, for example, a part of uh, the narrative of Black History Month. So I don't know what your views are on that. Thank you. Remarks that people would like to make or come back on any points. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I guess the, the one thing I want to say relates to the last question and the, and the several questions about black history that have come up, which is that I think, depending on who you're talking to, particularly younger, it's generally, sadly, just something for school. And there is, first of all, the risk that I've never mentioned up there of it turning into something completely inane. I mean, that, that happens in, in the States where I used to live. In February, it'd be like, Shell celebrates Black History Month. You know, get your <laughs> Martin Luther King badge and a free bag of chips or something. You know, it's of, it becomes part of a marketing strategy. And, um, and before you know it, you've lost the, um, the whole thing. I think there was, um, there was an issue with them selling a truck and using King's words, to, where King said, you know, it doesn't matter what you have, it matters who you are, and they completely turned this on its head in order to sell this bloody truck, which, if you read the whole speech, he talks about, we don't need more trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't matter. You, you know, you, you, can sell, you can sell the truck and you can sell it, and they just fold it into the kind of nonsense of, of capitalism and the basic repackaged and commodified. I think, particularly for children, history is best taught by them imagining themselves in it. The, th the reason why I like this book um, and the reason why it didn't surprise me was when somebody, you know, when I heard that he was a Marxist, I didn't say, really? God, no way. You know, it kind of because I saw myself in it, because the history you told was accessible. There were real people in it. It started from the experience of real people, and it branched out. History is all too often taught as something that happens to you. All kings and queens and leaders and treaties, with no sense of where that came from, which is why, if you take New Cross, there are people alive who can talk about New Cross, that you can make it a living thing, and from there, will come the kind of methodologies that people are talking about of how one might un understand oneself in the world and how one might think of history, not just as a series of disconnected events that happen to people and that the time that we live in now, someone will write about at some stage as being historical, that we are, you know, that it's a living thing and a lived, uh, and a lived thing. And that's, I really did, I didn't do A-level history, so this was, and I studied my French and Russian, this was really off piece for me when I read it, and it really did kind of um, um, connect me with the notion of what history might be that I hadn't had before. <laughs> grateful to have been able to take part in an event to celebrate the writer of a book of this importance. I think the, the thing which you sometimes forget is I, I wasn't brought up in London. I didn't have access to all of the things that 
being part of a community would give you. It was me and my family on a council of states, the only black family. So for people who were living sort of more atomized existences, this book was, was critical. I've met people for whom, um, who were, were adopted, who were the only, I mean, even more isolated than my family, whose parents kind of went out and saw this book in a shop and bought it for them and it answered questions. To me, this evening, and maybe it's because I'm a writer, it's about the power of writing. It's about the power of somebody taking on a colossal history. There had been histories before, but it never been synthesized in this way. There was bits and pieces in archives that never been brought together in this way. The power of doing that, the power of creating a piece of printed literature and then sending it out into the world, to me, that, that is as that is far as great achievement. And you know, I, when, when I was first a, um, a junior producer in the BBC, I said, God, you're so creative, you have all of these ideas. I kind of wanted to hide my copy of Staying Power, because they all came. <laughs> I found that I read Staying Power. I felt like, like a con man. Because if you guys actually bothered to read this book, you know it's that wasn't that original. It's, that's, that, that's, that's the power of, of, of literature, and that's what I want to express tonight. Gratitude. Well, no. I wish I'd known Gary when he was 16. He was in the how to get properly expelled. <laughs> <laughs> I once was expelled, but only for six months. And there were plenty of concerts expelled for six months. The first time I had to stand as a parliamentary elected candidate in the election in 1979. Peter would never have done that because he would have told the truth to the electorate. He wouldn't even remember the party that was uh, standing for government. Um, this is the beginning of a process, I hope I've said that before. I mean, I, I think it's been a terrific meeting. I'm, again, very grateful to Gary and David for, for helping to get this, what I hope is a process off the ground. And I, I hope that, um, I mean, it being a beginning of a process, there's so the question has been raised, really. Um, as some colleagues have said, I mean, we, 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 we want to develop this discussion um, as a discussion, not as uh, Kind of reiteration of all the dogmas. Um, because it's the beginning of a process, there's obviously there's going to be a tendency to go back to the old battles. And David and Gary have shown there are a lot of old battles that need to be fought, but they should only be fought if they're fought in the, uh, with a knowledge and uh, an understanding and a sensitivity to the new times that we live in and what is relevant to these new times, and not to reiterate um, uh, old dogmas and so on. But I think that just proves that we're starting something. Um, and I hope, particularly, that um, those who are under, what age should I say, uh, 30, 35, I hope they will have signed up because they want to be part of this ongoing discussion. And some of us will, if we have the email list, make sure we are people who are going to. I hope at one point we might have an academic conference with a lot of students. Uh, we might seek to develop a book about Peter Fry, of the essays perhaps. Um, there's all sorts of things we might do, and if you've got ideas about what we might do, uh, please, um, uh, please let us know. I think the only thing we're missing tonight, of course, sadly, is Peter himself. Um, the piano in the corner and sweet or being played. But I gather there is some other music to come, as well as some wine. There are boots in the back, um, and as I say, uh, please, those of you who are inspired by saying that, Read Hungarian tragedy and read this section as well. It's actually the 156 of um, notes. They're, they're not all kind of keys to a lifetime of further research, admittedly, but they're very um, interesting. And so you've got all sorts of people that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, but thank you all for coming. And, uh, I hope you can hear me. A great big thanks to Gary and David. Thank you. Um, and Terry. Um, uh, all very, very busy people. So thanks very much for giving us your time. It's great. The very numbers of people's family who are here. Thank you very, very much for coming. And thank you for joining us.
grant sponsors, which include UCL's Brennan Challenge to Cultural Understanding Office, I hope I've got that right, the <laughs> Joe Press, the Movement for Socialism, and also the group of people who organize this meeting. So thanks a lot. There are talks at the back, there's also wine. Okay, so please stay, mingle, talk, continue the conversation, have a glass of wine.